afternoon, everyone. Now you can hear me. How wonderful to have you all here. Um, it's a great honor to bring the VTT spin-off candidates on this magnificent stage here in Dipoli today um, at the Nordic Deep Tech Business Summit. Um, I thought I'd first introduce uh, VTT and and then uh, what Launchpad is, and then uh, we can dive into the pitches and hear our teams out. So a few words about VTT. Uh, VTT is a research and development partner that uh, uh, is owned by Finnish State. There's about 2,000 employees working at VTT, and about one third of us are uh, hold a doctorate. Uh, we were founded in 1942, and uh, currently we're quite international in the in our operations. So VTT's purpose is to, bring to, is to bring together people, business, science, and technology to solve world's great problems. And hence, of course, great, create sustainable growth and well-being. Here's a brief timeline of uh, VTT. Founded in 1942, you can imagine there were quite a few troubles in the world at the time. Um, and VTT focused at solving the national uh, challenges. Now, if you look then to today, our focus is very much in global challenges. And, uh, and uh, so, two years ago, we published a vision paper uh, on the path of exponential hope. And there we outline five technologies that we believe would make a great difference in the world. And if we look at this then, you know, I reflect a little bit on what our incubator has already in its three and a half years of existence uh, achieved. We have spun off uh, three teams in, in new proteins or in protein production. And if we then look at the, the, the lineup that is going to be on stage today, uh, we will find quantum computing their chemical recycling of plastics as well as uh, new material or novel material use. Uh, so, why we're here and why we're doing this is because in order to make the greatest impact of change is by spinning off startups. Um, in addition to VTT Launchpad, which is our internal incubator, we also host the Nordic uh, uh, node of the Food Accelerator Network, EIT. So diving into then VTT Launchpad, as an incubator, we were founded in 2019 in the spring, so we are now three and a half years of age. Um, now, historically, of course, VTT has been spinning off companies over the decades. So, uh, in that sense, uh, not totally brand new to us. However, we renewed the ways of working. So, what is VTT Launchpad? Um, it's an incubator that is committed to develop high-quality, fundable spin-off companies, companies with great impact aiming for global impact, and they are based on VTT-owned IPR. So VTT creates value uh, out of the IPR that it invests in the, in the growth companies. And VTT success is measured, among other measures, by the owners uh, through the amount of capital investments uh, invested into our past spin-offs each year. So last year, VTT spin-offs uh, attracted uh, approximately 104 million euros of capital investments.
What I like to always bring out is that there are uh, two significantly and fundamentally different ways for us to commercialize IPR. And one is our bread and butter, the, one, the, the everyday work that we do. And that is the contract research that we do with our corporate partners. And there we license and sell IPR. Um, and we prefer to grant the, the licenses with non-exclusive deals. And of course, it's price at market value. Now, now where we operate with the startups is the orange box, preferably, where we can actually carve out the IPR. It's clearly specified. And then we invest it in kind into startups. So two, these are two very different ways of handling IPR in uh, commercialization. So then, you know, just a brief slide on definition of a VTT spin-off currently. Uh, it is a company that VTT has invested its IPR into in kind in exchange for preferred shares alongside with capital investors with equal terms. Um, the IPR has been clearly specified and valued by a third party before the investment. And our target is typically the maximum of 10% of the startup. And, and we're really aiming for a great growth path for the company. So here's a team slide. Uh, picture needs to be updated. Uh, we have a new member, uh, Mio Silvenon, and joined us in the spring. Um, working on uh, business analytics. I myself, I'm Lotta Partanen. I lead incubation and acceleration. I always forget to introduce myself, apologies. Tia Maria Terunen, a long-term uh, VTT -er, researcher by background, uh, doctor of technology, um, is um, a manager of the incubator program. You can find her over there actually standing, waving her hand. And then Antti Pirnes, uh, is uh, in uh, is responsible for the IPR investment. Good. So I thought I'd give a kind of a quick slide on what the incubator program on a higher level offers and what our criteria are. Um, and then without diving much further into that, um, like I said, we have a long track record of uh, spinning off companies in the past. So there's a there's a kind of a quick glance at the logos, at least, of the companies that we have been spinning off. And the top line are the ones that have uh, graduated from the incubator itself. Um, if I highlight something out of this slide is, is um, something, you know, as a professional who's worked in uh, innovation in, in technology companies all my career, I must say that many of our teams are exceptionally customer-centric as they've worked with different kinds of industry partners all their careers at ETT. So, so you know, they, they understand the industry challenges and they're well networked in that. Um, and I think, you know, what is also worthwhile noting is that the IPR is quite solid, that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a clear asset uh, that our teams, um, is, is of value for our teams. Um, how you might participate if you wanted to kind of get in touch, you know, work with us uh, ahead of time or earlier than just in the investment phase. Um, there, are, there are ways of kind of collaborating with the teams, uh, uh, mentoring them, and sometimes there's opportunities in steering uh, research business projects, for example. Good. So... Like I said, in the three and a half years of existence of ETT Launchpad, we have spun off uh, four teams. And um, I think at least two of them are here today and tomorrow on stage. So we saw, saw uh, Maya Itkonen, I think she was on stage earlier today from Onego Bio. And I believe uh, Tuure Parviane from Volare team also will be here tomorrow in, in, uh, on the stage. Great. So, so to learn more about our teams, uh, I welcome you to visit our website. Um, you can find our contact information there also. So do reach out if you want to kind of get to uh, get in contact with the with the incubator team. Also, you find all the startups there lined up, and uh, and more information about them if you click on the icon and enter the page. Good. 
So, so I welcome you once again to meet and greet our teams. And uh, I'll be working as your host today. So the way we work today is that uh, we have, I think, eight teams pitching. And then we have a uh, panel of investors seated here in the front row. We have uh, Jane Valarud from Valarud Ventures. Welcome. We have uh, Pontus Stormov from, from Voima Ventures. Thank you for participating. And then finally, Kim Group, is it? Thank you. From First Fellow Partners. So, so instead of opening this, the floor for anyone to pose questions, we thought that it would be a more fluent uh, afternoon if we have a panel who poses the questions to our teams. And then you can meet, you know, if you have further questions, please pull on our team sleeves and talk to them afterwards. Great. Welcome, everyone. And um, I'm very happy to um, invite to the stage Team Granarium that, has, that is developing electricity storage everywhere. Welcome. Yes. Hi all, I'm Paula from Granarium. Our vision is to change the way electricity is stored. We use nanocellulos to build 100% renewable electricity storage. Our mission is sustainable and safe solutions where the instant high peak power is needed. According to the GTK study, nearly 38,000 terawatt hours extra power is needed to completely phase out fossil fuels. Yeah. This means that new solutions to store electricity are needed quickly to cover the increasing demand and need for the uh, transition to renewables. The current battery solutions will not cover this massive need alone, and they consume non-sustainable, scarce and unethical resources. Now we studied whether it would be possible to build an electricity storage by using only renewable materials. Supercapacitor is very interesting technology as it uses carbon-based materials to store electricity. However, it uses also synthetic binders like electrolytes and, um, that are not environmental friendly. And we realized that we'll have one technology that uses only renewable materials and we can build new type of supercapacitor. High consistency nanocellulose can bind uh, different types of biocarbons that can act as an electricity storage. High consistent nanocellulose is a unique material component that has a range of different material sources, wood pulp, textile fibers, agro residuals, and these are all affordable materials. And we want to make sustainable material choices, like activated carbon, all are 100% renewable. Supercapacitor, well, it's super fast and efficient in charging and discharging. The power density, it has, it's very high and from seconds to minutes. And therefore, we are concentrating into the use cases where the high specific power is needed. It has very long life cycle compared to the batteries and therefore it's almost service free. And it can survive well in the demanding conditions. To sum up, we can build 100% renewable electricity storage, supercapacitor. We'll have infinite supply of materials that enables also local, responsible and self-sufficient production. The characteristics of the material enables design freedom and makes our solution easy to integrate. The production is simple and low cost which makes larger size supercapacitors very capex effective and scalable. The solution is super fast, from seconds to minutes, so where that type of operating power is needed. And finally, it's safe and secure. We do not need any harmful chemicals nor safety facilities in the production. Our first uh, commercial application would be electricity grid stabilizer. 
Now, transition to new uh, renewable energy solutions has raised new type of challenges. The current power grid network is not designed to support and secure stable uh, distribution of renewables. This is a globally recognized challenge. Uh, there are two leading needs. The current the, um, uh, new renewable energy production system requires solutions to stabilize the production interruptions and voltage fluctuations. Also, they need um, backup power uh, to cover the um, supply fails of windmills and solar power plants. And secondly, the old mechanical uh, energy systems like water power plants, they are slow. And they are in danger to be removed from the energy, production, energy reserve markets. And that would be quite a waste. So um, we can provide small scale fast reserve for both of these cases. Our solution is cost efficient, scalable and safe. And that would free the scarce lithium reserves into more efficient use cases. Um, we have built a simple model to explain the business logic. With 20 million uh, investment, we would produce uh, 30 electricity storage size of sea container. The capacity of one sea container size uh, electricity storage would be 100 kilowatt hours. As a direct comparison, there would be water power plant backup storage using similar capacity and using traditional supercapacitor. So you, the use case is already in uh, action. And so basically we can provide enough time or power to quick and secure the uh, uh, production interruptions and fluctuations or super fast charging. The spin of milestones, we are now, we'll have now reached the business process ongoing until February 2023. But then we are aiming to reach the spin of readiness as well as uh, our larger size uh, uh, functional demo is ready. After that, we will uh, build, test and optimize the uh, pilot, uh, commercial pilot production as well as uh, the uh, pilot cases in a real environment. Once we'll have validated results, we will build the industrial scale pilot plan. These are the most critical milestones to ensure the uh, scale continuum and pathway for the new innovations, like utilizing the design freedom and building a new product uh, concept. This is our core team. I'll have 20 plus years from um, leadership, uh, startups, uh, innovation and uh, product making, while Otto Wille has um, broad experience of developing new high value use cases of cellulose, cellulose based materials and uh, production methods. We are looking for 2 million seed funding to ramp up the pilot production, accelerating the product development, building the winning team and finally releasing the first commercial size pilots. Thank you. Otto Wille, please join. This is the team. Thank you, Paula. Excellent pitch. Can you say something about technology readiness level? So you're building a pilot plant next year, but how well have you got it to function in, in the VTT laboratories? Well, we have tested the functionality in the laboratory level and currently we are building a functional prototype. So we are aiming for a technology readiness level around five or six during this year. And, and continuing on that unit economics, have, have you gained an understanding of how you would be in unit economics compared to existing supercapacitors? We have made some extensive calculations on how expensive the production would be, how expensive the materials would be. And we know for quite certain that we are going to be a lot cheaper. Uh, so, thank you for the pre presentation. Um, so now, having the co-founders on the stage, uh, yes. <laughs> wh what kind of domain expertise do you see uh, yourself lacking in order to successfully uh, validate the pilot line phase and also kind of start on production level and then, you know, thinking ahead for the commercialization? What would be the, let's say, the top three critical recruits you would like to bring on board? Good question. Well, we definitely need someone who has experience in 
developing manufacturing lines. And mm-hmm. this person we have already identified and yes, agreed to join us if he secured the funding. Uh, then we have need a system integrator, so someone who knows what it takes to bring this type of devices to actual use cases in the grid level. And probably we also need an electrochemist to make the device even more powerful. Oh, do you agree? And the first pilot uh, production we are going to do in the facilities of our partners, so where we are already discussing about the equipment. It's often a um, wonderful way to scale uh, if you can get off-take agreements with your customers so that if you can possibly get a contract with Good L in Swedish or anything in Finland, whatever, that says that they will buy 20 of these per year or 20 of these if they meet the following specifications. And if you do meet the specifications, they have to pay you anyway, whether or not you deliver, okay? That kind of contract will unlock an amazing amount of investment for you. Um, they are well known. They're called off-take agreements. Please take a look at them, okay? Um, I, w- I would suggest that first, I suppose. And the next thing I would suggest is that if you really are at lab scale now, what risks do you see? between here and the first pilot? And how do you mitigate them, each one of them? Okay, Because that's your next level, right? Yes. And what's gonna, what might go wrong on the way there, and how are you going to make sure that doesn't go wrong? Do you want to go first? Uh, yeah. Well, we actually have now the parts ready for the real pile scale device, where it's a building at the moment. So we are moving from centimeter scale to one meter scale. But after that, of course, when we move from one meter to real sea container size scale, that's something that we just need to do with our selected partners. So we are teaming with the manufacturers who know to upscale. Okay, so one risk is scaling from one meter to four meters. Uh, I can imagine meters. another, or 10 meters, another risk might be that the two of you don't get along. Another risk is you don't actually get to spin out. Another one is that you don't actually get the off-take agreements. Uh, and that's just me sitting here thinking wildly. There must be others. Luckily, we get along quite well. So. <laughs> can you see this? <laughs> Love. <laughs> Yes, it's well, where we have spent the last 14 months working really tightly together. So at, at this point, I can for certainly say that we probably get along better than, for example, me and my wife at the moment. So. Oops. <laughs> but just in a professional way. And seriously, we have been discussing um, tough things. What's who we are? And what does it make to build a uh, startup? I have that experience from background, and it's not easy. And it takes quite a bit of a guts and really like a chicken in your back. <laughs> but nonetheless, this is such a unique uh, uh, innovation that uh, makes my heart to pump. So yeah, we, we share the similar values, mm. uh, sustainability and uh, will to not mess up with our world anymore. So, so one Thank more. You. you said you're going to be cheaper than your competition. That's not a good idea. How about more expensive? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I need to intervene. We need to move on with the program. Perhaps you can continue the discussion in a moment. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much you. for the team. Thanks for the active and uh, active uh, and uh, uh, interesting questions for the panel. Um, oh, very good. So next, coming up, we have team Carbonade that has developed carbon dioxide as an ingredient in 
creating CO2 negative concrete. Welcome. So hello, my name is Tapio Vemas and I'm here to present Team Carbonate. So the Carbonate is providing technology for concrete manufacturers to use and store CO2 into concrete. The concrete itself is, is a little bit of a problem because it causes 6 to 7 percent of the global CO2 emissions. And there are no realistic alternatives for concrete because we consume 10 billion cubic meters of concrete per year. The big carbon footprint comes from the production of cement that is a binder material in concrete. And, and producing cement, it causes close to one to one CO2 emissions per ton. So there are no industrially feasible solutions to decrease the carbon footprint of concrete. But the legislation is tightening. In 25, we have a new construction law applied in Finland that will set an emission limit for the, for the housing. So something needs to be done. On the other hand, we have seen more and more carbon capture projects coming in place. But when you capture the CO2, you have to do something with it. You can use it to make some short-term materials, like uh, synthetic tools, plastics, using it as food products and things like that. Or you can store it uh, permanently, meaning that you transport it somewhere and put it on the geological deposits. There are not that many industrially feasible technologies that can, pro that can provide both aspects. And, and these kind of technologies that can provide value for CO2, but at the same time store it away, will have a special value. And our technology is one of those technologies. So we provide carbonation that is beneficial in concrete manufacturing. Typically carbonation is seen as a harmful decoration mechanism in concrete, but when you apply it during the curing, that reverses. So we can use CO2 as a cement replacement material in concrete. So it has a special use, but at the same time it mineralizes as carbonates and it's stored permanently in the system. Uh, with our technology, we can help the CO2 emissions from the traditional concrete manufacturing, meaning that we can use less cement and then we can the rest part, we can provide carbonates in the system. If we combine our uh, technology with blended cements that have a smaller footprint than, than normal cement, we can get close to zero CO2 emissions. And when we use non-portland cement binders, just as platform stack or things like that, we can get negative emissions for the concrete. Globally, this means that our target is to reduce CO2 emissions of the concrete industry by 500 megatons per year in 2050. A single production line can mineralize CO2 from 1 ton to 20 tons, depending on the size of their unit. And then they can save cement that will also cause uh, further CO2 reduction. And if this is fully extended, to whole element industry in the world, the total emissions capacity is 1.5 gigatons per year. What we do so good, what is our special thing, is that this carbonation depends a lot how we can impregnate the CO2 into concrete. And we have uh, created technology that enables high penetration of CO2 into concrete in atmospheric pressures. We use atmospheric pressures because then we can uh, combine this technology to the existing uh, concrete production lines. So it's easily scalable in different applications. And of course, we have applied patent for this. So we have a pilot unit. It has been there for one year and it situates in, in Hollola near Lahti. And with this unit, we have tested our technology. We have treat different concrete products with it and see how it goes. Theoretically, we can treat two to three cubic meters of concrete in this unit. Uh, in reality, it's much less because we can't, uh, we can't load the container so full that we could carbonate that much. 
But this is the technology scale up and our technology readiness level with this pilot unit is, is six at this moment. The global markets of concrete are of course big and there are two main sectors where we can apply it. It is the precast concrete products that is worth of 40 billion US dollars and then there is the concrete element markets that are 93 billion US dollars per year. Our business model is that we provide these kind of units for concrete manufacturers and then we sell the CO2 for them. There are no available low quality CO2 at the markets at this moment and we will provide this CO2 for them. And of course we can offset this CO2 so if the concrete manufacturer does not decrease the carbon footprint of their concrete products, we can sell the mineralized CO2 as an offset. And here is our plan. So our plan is that the Lahti unit, where we have an autopilot unit, is converted to the one-fifth scale uh, full operational system in the beginning of the next year. And during the next year, we will uh, expand the unit and at the end of the next year, the whole Lahti production plant is under this technology. In 24, we will do what, first our commercial unit and in 25-26, uh, Vanta Energia will provide a, a large amount of CO2 for us and, and it means that we need 10 to 15 concrete production lines under this technology by then. But I have seen that there is a big market interest for this so uh, it's, it's quite realistic to get that. Yes, thank you. Um, I think it's evident about the, the emission reduction possibility and the regulation that will play a role there. Uh, can you uh, open up a bit on the total cost of ownership? So what is the comparable price for a, a construction company and similar if they would engage with you? So we can replace cement with CO2. That causes a cost reduction. They have to, of course, pay something for the CO2. So the price level is equal to the current technology level or it is lower. Uh, if you want to get much cheaper products, you can replace cement with other binders that are reactive carbon dioxide. And, and you can use uh, material sources that no one else is using. And that will cost a uh, huge uh, cost reduction for your production. Have you, have you been able to run any numbers? I mean, I, I understand it's simulation, but you talked about, you know, technology readiness. Obviously, access to some of these alternative materials, it may be, a, uh, you know, a higher cost. Have you looked into that? What is the cost model for the various options? Yeah, we have developed this kind of cost model. The big thing is that where the CO2 comes from. And, and we have now a uh, letter of intent with with uh, Vanta Energia, that they will sell the CO2 for us at the price that it is affordable for the whole uh, production chain. So one of the, I'm, I'm co-founding a startup which is kind of similar, so I'm not gonna talk a lot, but there, one of the problems with new kinds of concrete is uh, getting regulation so that they are accepted for different applications, right? There is a company called Mixtristing in Austria, together with the Technical University of Vienna, that do AI testing of different concrete mixes, and they can get your concrete certified in EU in about six months. It's probably worth doing, Mixtristing. Okay. Yeah, so the standardization is something that is affecting a lot of construction industry. Luckily, our process is a post-treatment process that is not typically controlled in the standards. So if we just can provide the fact that we don't change that much of the composition, uh, we should not have a problems with the standards. All right, because that was going to be my my. Uh, Question also, do you think it will be easy to uh, sell to consumers uh, this kind of a 
concrete or, or, or people who are in charge of building projects that, that it will be as tolerable as, as your Portland cement. Yeah, uh, actually we go to the nearer thermodynamic equilibrium. So, so typically the surface of the concrete carbonates during the first years, like few millimeters on the top of it, and that makes it less soluble for water. So, so it's not difficult to sell this because these kind of things are already known by the industry. And at this moment, there is a great need for this kind of products. So actually, they, were, they are already willing to take some risks with the products. Of course, not in the structural members of the things, but, but like pavements, it's, it's something that they are willing to do. To, to, it can cost more and it, <laughs> and it can be like that there is a need for these things. That's for sure. That's for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tapio. Great. So moving on from concrete to a revolution that is making plastic fully circular. Please, Olefai. Thank you. I'm Matti, Matti Nieminen from uh, Olefai Technologies and I introduce our technology to you. We really believe that Olefai can make plastic really circular, which is not the whole truth today. We see that it is the first technology which can make uh, econo which, which can which can be seen as a really circular recycling technology, and this is based on a few facts. In the fact, our technology is based on not two, three years development. We have developed classification technology already more than forty years. Personally, I have developed forty-two years, and so this is really based on long experience, also in industrial scale, and. Uh, this has been, uh, this happened at VTT. We have even make, made commercial several technologies. Until now, we have eight patents pending, everyone related to our Olefi technology. And so we, we try to protect so that uh, you know, there is no one else who, do, who is doing similar technology today in, in the globe, in the world. And what is, what is the characteristics for Olefi? It's a one step process. We are not basing our technology for different process steps, because every step has a conversion factor. And finally, you have to multiply all of these factors together in order to see that what is the overall yield from plastic waste to all things, for example. We have only one step, and this helps us a lot, because uh, the yield from our olefi process, and yield means that how much recycled olefins we can produce from one ton of plastics it is the highest what we have seen with any other technology. In optimal conditions, we have detected even 61% production of olefins from plastic waste. Of course, it was in optimal conditions, but it tells something. Even from NAFTA, for example, which is a normal way to do nowadays, uh, typically ethylene production is 30 to 33%, and some 10, 15% per populene so that the overall yield is less than 50%, we can, have, we can make more than 60, 61. In addition to that, we have even 11% aromatics, recycled, chemically recycled, virgin grade aromatics, which are also valuable products for our process. And the rest, roughly 28%, this is used for energy production in the process, of the process so that we, are not, we don't need any external energy. We are self-sufficient from energy point of view. This is also a benefit. And uh, if you look at CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions, we have estimated, we can't make the detailed estimate now, because we have to know the site to, to which we compare. But we have estimated 50 to even 66% reduction of CO2 emissions compared to traditional NAFTA cracker. And our product is recycled. So if I compare to other technologies, we have even uh, more than 50% higher yield in some cases. So this is really important issue from economic point of view. We can also accept rather low quality plastic waste for our feed so that it can contain contaminants. And our products, they are equal to virgin grade plastics, olefins. But what makes olefi then economically feasible? This is from our pilot plant. 
if you first look, this is a conventional uh, NAFTA cracker. So that uh, this is used nowadays to produce polyolefins, plastic pack material, for example. So it's a huge uh, industrial plant, uh, very expensive. A greenfield investment up to, uh, up to 6 mil billion US dollars to invest on such. It's absolutely too much for us. Olefi does not have such kind of money. We are not even dreaming that, no. Our idea is, and this is one part of our innovation, we will, be, we will integrate our facilities to the steam cracker because the product from our process, it's a mixture of gases. And the most, import, most expensive part of the process is how to separate different fractions. And we are now utilizing the existing cryogenic distillation system, which exists at each steam cracker in the world. And this makes, we save, we can save even billions, to be honest. And this is very essential for us. We can have there several, and the target is to have several OLEFI modules uh, together. Another issue having very, imp very essential impact for us is that the price value of the product is two to four times higher compared to NAFTA made polyolefins. This makes good for us. And the available market in roughly 450, 500 uh, uh, steam crackers in the world, each of them has several furnaces and each furnace can be replaced by several olefi reactors. So we have a potential for thousands of reactors. And briefly said, Olefi Technologies, it's a spin-off company from VTT, and we are now commercializing this technology. VTT has committed to transfer uh, IPR for, for, uh, in exchange to, to equity. And now we are looking for investors, primary investors, but also strategic partners. We are negotiated, we are negotiating, and we have negotiated already more than two years uh, with technology providers, steam cracker operators, also global brand owners. And so we, we are really ready to go ahead. We have already our, in the three persons in our team. Of course, technology is, is very much based on VTT technology. Patrice Arnes, my colleague, is also here. And then finally, what, we are, what are the numbers we are looking for now? The first two years during, during the period, period, we will make the preliminary design, not preliminary, detailed design of the demo plant. We make a field study for the demonstration plant. We make the feasibility studies, and after two years, we have a complete readiness for investment decision on the demo plant. Why we do it so carefully is that the investment on the demo plant, it's about 100 million euros. This is not any small scale activity. We are talking about heavy petrochemical industry, and that's why it's rather expensive. Uh, we have negotiated with many of the operators, and they see that this is completely okay. And uh, now we are looking for this uh, seed investment for this 50 million euros. And our uh, mission is that uh, we see that Olefi saves the planet for our children and grandchildren, but very important, economically attractive way. Thank you. Thank you, convincing pitch. Uh, how much of today's plastic waste in, in percentage could you push through uh, your process at the moment? Excellent question. 63%. This is based on the fact, I can explain, this is based on the fact that 63%, 2019, 63% of all plastics produced in the world, it was polyethylene, polypropylene. In principle, all of that can be recycled based on olefi like technology. Okay, this is only in theory, but in theory, 63%. If you look ahead five years, ten years, what 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 do you see as the main business? Is it to, you know, be a key partner, also building up the you know similar, um, let's say, waste production facilities or cleaning facilities, or is it more licensing to a different? Uh, yeah, companies? If, you, if you mean our business, your business. Yeah, yeah. We are not aiming to own the plants. We are not aiming to co construct any hardware by all of our company. We are licensing. And that's why we have been negotiating already a couple of years with technology providers, so that uh, we, we work together. We know that from investor point of view, uh, it, it would be much better to have the completely, complete freedom, but without technology provider, we are very, very small. So we need the technology provider. And finally, of course, we also need the petrochemical uh, operator. And then we need also different kind of actors, but most important is technology provider as well as the petrochemical operator. 
really exciting if we can actually use our plastic waste. It's just wonderful. Okay. So well, can if we can actually use our plastic waste, that's great. That's wonderful. Okay. Yeah. You're asking for a fair amount of money. And that's a reasonable amount of money. It's just a lot for me and I think for Pontus. Uh, don't know about you. Uh, maybe you have an extra 100 million euros to play with. Because it's so much money, you probably need to get the petrochemical company involved. Yes. And you also probably need to get an extremely good storyteller involved. Yeah. Because this is all about storytelling. And I would suggest the people doing ocean cleanup. No, yeah. I agree that the amount for as a seed funding is it's large. I agree. But on the other hand, we are talking about heavy industry. No, no, no. I, yeah. I'm not saying you're asking ah. for too much money. Sorry. I'm just saying it, it, you undoubtedly need that amount of money. But that means you have to look at an investor profile, which is different from the one sitting here. Yes. Yeah. We don't have 100 million euros. No. Okay? We just don't. No. Okay? But given that, then in order to get that kind of investment, then maybe you could get the cracker companies to invest in you. Yeah. They're making a lot of money right now. Okay? Yep. Yep. The other thing you can need to do is have a storytelling around it because that will make it possible to get European funding. Yep. Yeah? Awesome. I would suggest then one of the best storytellers it is, is this a uh, guy doing ocean cleanup from the Netherlands. Yep. You just, just you need somebody to say, we're taking the Pacific garbage patch and turning it into raw virgin materials. Or something, you know, something that just makes people stand up and cheer. Yeah. Because 100 million euros, you need to cheer. Yep. So, uh, to be honest, our, our target has been all the time that steam cracker operator will be the main investor to the demo plant, yes, exactly. But we have prepared to collect also about 30 million euros uh, from OLFI point of view, because we need access to the results from the demo plant. If we are not an investor, we have difficulties in that. And that's why we are, we, are, we already have negotiated with the national funding, uh, public funding, as well as we are targeting to commission innovation fund in order to get some funding to have one, some share of the demo plant. This is our target. Wonderful, and find a storyteller. You can do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I fully agree with Jane. So I, I guess, I mean, we, we need this. So good luck. Thank you. And I will be there also after this. So please come. Thank you, Matti. <laughs> Next, coming up. We have the OBU team that outshines visual experiences. Welcome. Hi, my name is Teemu Ruotsalainen and I'm here to pitch about OBU. We provide an optical solution for multiple applications. Our core team composes for four different uh, persons. We have an R&D background, but we have also a lot of experience in startups and um, entrepreneurship, sales and marketing. We have a strength in our team with collaboration of uh, industrial designer and marketing and sales professional. Here is our product portfolio. Let's start with active privacy filters. With our de technology, you can protect your screen from visual hacking and shoulder surfing. This uh, privacy filter can be turned on and off with a push of a button. And uh, currently there is two other type of uh, active uh, filters in market, but they only work in LCD displays and they have a lot to improve in user experience. Our technology works on all different type of electronic displays and it doesn't affect on the user experience. It can be also used broadly in laptops, desktop, ATM, kiosk, um, tablets and um, cell phones. We are currently having a discussion with two major uh, 
computer brands. And here is our product demo video. It doesn't... Oh, it's, it's on. So with the push of a button, you can protect your screen and uh, protect the side view from visual hacking. And it doesn't affect on the user experience. So user has a crystal view, crystal clear view. Um, our second product is smart windows. We provide uh, smart windows which have one-way transparent properties, and that's unique. All the other smart windows block the view on both sides. Our system can be used in office, office booths, public-private buildings and households, so basically everywhere where there is windows. Our system can be also retrofitted, and currently we are having a negotiation with the booth manufacturer. And here is product demo, 10 by 10 centimeters of a smart window. Here it is in off states. And here you can see our window in on states. On the left hand side you can see the view from inside to outside. And from right hand side you can see picture from outside to inside. So this is truly one way um, transparent window. And here is Artix's illustration how our windows could be used in households. So you can have your privacy and view at the same time. Our third product is transparent design lightning elements and uh, decorative surfaces. So same technology with a little bit of alternation can be also used in um, illuminating surfaces. And here is an example of an uh, illuminating wall. And our third, uh, fourth product is uh, signages. So where there is need of delicate light, we can have it, for example, in museums and so on. And let's go to the global market size. So currently, high-end lighting market is $15.5 billion. Smart window market size a little bit more than $1 billion. And a privacy product market size $700 million. Our business model bases on product sales and licensing. And with this business model, after four operative years, we will have 10 million euro revenue and 5 million euro profit. We have strong IPR and knowledge. We have three patents and more patents to become. We have also a lot of know-how and we have been recognized by Launchpad, Business Finland and uh, last year we won an innovation competition called Start Me Up. Until this point we have spent 750,000 euros in technology development and currently we are looking for one and a half million dollar seed funding with a 3.8 million euro pre-money valuation. We have already one handshake for investors and we are looking for more. Uh, money will be spent on product launches together with customer, productization, brand, IPR, and we will also grow three, our team and need premises. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Every startup needs uh, uh, someone who's really enthusiastic about the technology, someone who's really screaming that they need one. So you had a, a, a bit of a few uh, routes to market with a, bit, uh, a couple of different products. So can you tell us where do you find that closest product market fit where, where you are at the moment? So who is going to be your, your first customer and, and how... How can you be certain that they are sort of screaming for, for this kind of a product? Uh, well, with computer manufacturers, we have, have a discussion for a long time already. And now we are delivering them a technology demonstrator on their own laptops. And uh, they are really interested on that. So we, did, we see this as a good lead. And also this um, office booth manufacturer, we just... Um, uh, made a demo for them and uh, we got good, good comments about it and now we are discussing it further. Your different market segments, I don't know, but it 
seems likely that they are rather different, okay? that you'll have a different production volume, you'll have a different sales cycle, uh, the people you're talking to will be different people. And that means it might be difficult to do all three or four at once to start with. And I guess that's the same question that Pontus asked. That, so which one of them, if you had to choose one, I would suggest choosing the one where they're actually asking you to produce more immediately, if there is one like that. I mean, at the moment, you're still at the stage of you have four and we'll see which one it is. But the instant one of them starts to pull, please focus on that, okay? And employ salespeople that know that industry. So for instance, there is a VC here called node.vc, N-O-D-E. Um, they come from a company called Tobi, it's Swedish, most of them. And they have done huge technology integrations with laptop manufacturers. So if you want that kind of focus, then I would suggest talking to Morten Skogu, who's here. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering as well um, how much you can actually produce. How big a surface can you produce at the moment? Where Sorry. are you in TRL? Can you repeat it? I didn't. Where, so that was just the, the whole market thing. Okay? The next thing is how big a surface can you produce at the moment? And what's your scale up plan? So in, um, in this place, we have, our demo is 15.6 inches. So it's laptop size. And now we are doing a little bit bigger. We have also made a 41 inches monitor. This is a working, working demo. And uh, what comes to Windows is that we need to upscale it. Our demonstrator was uh, 40 centimeters times 70 centimeters. So that's really small for a window size, but it can be upscaled. There's a company also here called PFAL, Solar Technologies. They, they, there's another company here, another startup, that when I met them, they could make maybe three, four centimeters square. And now they're up to maybe a piece of paper. Uh, and that what they're doing now is selling very small pieces. Um, they're a solar cell thing, and, and they sell to shells, shell, shelving, right? So if you can think of something where what you produce now is good enough, where you can produce more at the size you are, and they actually want it, I mean, you're at that stage, sort of a, what can you do with what you have now? Because investing in making huge window size things without a real market pull, that's hard. Perhaps just to continue on that thread of thought, I mean, obviously there are different kind of uh, application opportunities, different kind of markets with different kind of setups. Um, so. My question, without understanding this market at all, um, is it a kind of a three different products trying to find a market, or is there always already kind of a a must-have need out there? And uh, in addition to that, do you know what the cost would be, uh, and how more affordable it could eventually be, or on par with the other similar solutions, taking into account the benefits? Yeah. So we started with uh, smart windows, and then we noticed that it can, this technology can be used also in uh, displays. We have the privacy protector, and that was really interesting. So we focused on these two ones, and uh, then we found out that uh, also different kind of illumination surfaces would be nice. But uh, we are not focusing on them, them at this moment, so we, can, we have demonstrated that it works, and that will be later when we have time and um, muscle power to do that. Now we are focusing on these two products, smart windows and displays. Probably the next step good to try to figure out what are the unit economics and what kind of gross margin, what would be the cost as well. Sorry, I didn't get it. Um, I was just making a, uh, well, probably the next step besides trying to find out who would be the best buyer and kind of the application would to understand truly what is the nature of the unit economics 
what, what is the cost of production? What kind of gross margin? What would the reasonable price point be for a purchaser? Yep, we have a calculation on that. So um, our displays and regarding our displays and um, smart windows, so we are really competitive on those. All right, Lotta is already standing there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Teemu. Thank you. Great. Four more to go. Coming up, we have the Warming Surfaces Company that wants to provide us with the, the simplicity of control of warmth at the simplicity of controlling light. Welcome. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Jani Mikael Kuusista. Our company name hopefully says what we're all about. But I'll talk about a very basic need, which is warmth. And all of a sudden, with the skyrocketing energy prices, it's also becoming a luxury of sorts. Warming is a factor that has been actually overlooked for quite some time. Yes, we have the heat pumps. Yes, we as homeowners have always been a little bit concerned about the energy costs when we heat our buildings, our homes in the winter. But of course, this year in, in particular, it's become very crucial. But from a global perspective and a sustainability perspective, this has been a problem for a long time. 63% of all the energy consumed in residential buildings in the EU go to warming up the spaces that we live in. Talk about global warming, 63%. Over 20% of the CO2 emissions in the EU come from heating buildings. And in North America, 48% of all the energy consumed go to heating. And the reason for that is that we still heat the buildings in a similar fashion as our ancestors did living in the caves. We light a fire and then we expect the heat to spread to us through the air. We're warming the air. But if there are any architects in the room right now, one of the first things you learn when you start studying architecture is the reason we feel cold is because the surfaces around us are sucking heat from us. So you're standing in a room, those cold surfaces are drawing energy from you and thereby you feel cold. So our solution is to bring warmth to surfaces, energy efficiently and in a manner that uses much, re much less resources than what we've used resources up until now. This is a technology that is entering a conservative space. We know there is a lot of built infrastructure. Our claim is not that you go and destroy all your heating systems that are already there. Our claim is go and reduce your temperature levels. We've all finally started to learn this. Even, even the Minister of Trade is now telling us reduce your heating by one Celsius and you'll save 5% in energy costs. What we're saying is you can retrofit these warming surfaces very easily. They're very rapid to control and we can quickly provide over 20% energy savings in your total energy bill. Our vision is to control heating or warmth like you control lighting. By bringing these heated surfaces pixelated heating surfaces into our living environments. Not only does it save energy, but it provides individual heat and warmth. And the next speaker will tell you more about why that is very critical. The technology to integrate heaters into different interior surfaces 
is proven in industrial scale at VTT. This is a real execution of how we bring the heaters onto paper that are then pressed into high pressure laminates that are used in floors, walls, doors, IKEA furniture. The heating is controlled digitally, so it's digital warmth, very fast response, low operating voltages. And we use significantly less materials to produce these heaters than any other conventional heating form. Next month, the world population will be 8 billion. 2050, the world population will be 10 billion. The UN has said that we need to build 13,000 new buildings per day if we're going to house all the people in the planet. We cannot continue to build like we conventionally did. And that applies also to heating. We cannot have bulky, heavy radiators. We need to have thin surfaces. The metal that we apply is either aluminum or copper, vastly available, fully recyclable, and we apply them at ultra thin layers, 200 micron layers. You know floor heating. I'm just gonna say one quick thing. Now when you have your floor heating be below the floor, this is an insulating material. 80% of that heat wants to go down and it's very slow to come up. We bring it to the top surface. So talk about deep tech. This is very superficial technology. The heating is right there. And it's not only laminates, but also textiles and many different materials. And I just want to give some perspective on the market opportunity. 3.6 billion square meters of flooring materials are installed every year in North America. Most of those go into old buildings. Meanwhile, floor heating is not installed into old buildings because you need thick layers of material. Ours requires 200 microns, that's 0 0.2 millimeters. We have go-to-market partners. We're launching our first product next May. You see from their factory that it is already being applied in large area. These will go into hotel room walls. Many other areas where we can apply the heaters, our focus is interior surfaces. Three middle-aged men starting this company, 20 years of experience, all of us in this printed electronics. And we're looking for a seed round of financing to be raised next spring. We just closed our pre-seed and are starting the company this month. And it would be great to see more investors join us. Thank you. Thank you. So, so very good pitch. Uh, who, who loves this product and, and uh, why? I mean, you said that you are, you are now scaling with an industrial partner. So yes. can you open up that, that partner and, and a bit sort of the use case that they envision? Yes, I have to be a little bit careful not to disclose too much. But I can say that they're not Finnish companies. We live in a country where we have, have had and still have relatively cheap energy, and we heat the environment all the time. The real hunger for this technology is in markets like California, UK, uh, I heard today south of China, um, Portugal, Spain, where you actually feel really cold in the winter because A, energy has always been expensive and the heating systems are not in place. So you have a team's call to Portugal, they'll wear their winter coats, and you're in Finland sitting with your t-shirt on. The ones that want our technology first are in these countries where they feel cold inside in the winter. Really interesting novel, novel uh, product. Um, if you think about the, from, let's say, the construction company or the, the go-to-market partners yes. in the future, uh, do they see this as a complementary solution for them as well, or is it eventually down the road, will it be kind of um, replacing other heating solutions? What is the kind of the, the vision from your perspective and together with the partners? Yeah, so when we calculate that there is a $250 million addressable market within five years, that calculation is based on two assumptions. One is 
in old buildings and retrofitting them with new heating systems. Again, not replacing what's in place, reducing that power consumption and having a secondary source where we can quickly control the comfort temperature. That's one segment. The other is modular building. So we are working with a construction company, non-finish, that is in the area of modular buildings. And they love the fact that they can install these heaters in their factory. They're ultra light and thin, so they can be shipped to the location and they can build say, an, a hotel in two weeks. So these are the two leading perspectives. Retrofitting with thin new heaters, and then these modular building, which will be the way to deliver those 13,000 new buildings per day. And also we assume it's quite in inexpensive to develop. Uh, yes, we don't, we don't base our pricing based on square meters, like the construction industry would like. But what we're doing is we're collecting data on the total cost of ownership in terms of installation cost, energy consumption through its lifetime, as well as materials. And like I said, we use far less materials than any heating system that you can install today. I would imagine that given Europe will not have enough energy for not this winter, not next winter, and probably not the winter after that, that there is a fair amount of interest in the European Investment Fund in European investment bank in making sure that this technology as fast as you can scale it gets into people's homes in central europe uh, yes the time is now i i i only hope we were <laughs> in a bit more advanced state but like said next may we're launching the first product and assuming it's successful this is a technology that it can scale Again, perspective, addressable market size, $250 million in the next five years, requires 10 of those machines that you saw in the picture. Not more than 10 machines. So we can produce. Right. I think you need to talk to the European Investment Bank. Honest. I was told that earlier today, so I guess I do need to do so. All right. Thank All right. You, Thank you, you very much. Stay warm. So moving from the environmental heat to there we go. Understanding what is the optimal heat for a human being. So we have the team C by Human Thermal Solutions uh, and uh, non-invasive thermal monitoring, real time, all the time. Welcome. Thanks. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Pekka Tuomala, and together with the co-founder Harri Lehti, we have founded a startup company. HTM Solutions, and we have developed a brand new deep tech solution we want you to see. C is a new paradigm for monitoring thermal status of an individual. The cold fact behind all this is that over 70,000 people died during heat waves in Europe in the year 2003. And this year has been estimated to be even worse. According to International Labour Organization, they have estimated that economic losses because of heat stress is huge. It's 2.4 billion US dollars. In a little bit different uh, numbers, this heat loss during heat stress is corresponding to 80 million jobs. So obviously something needs to be done. Solving these challenges, first of all, requires something for, from uh, policymakers. 
we can bring something technical investment uh, possible to this, and naturally behavioral changes are needed. And actually, what C is all about, it's a platform making unvisible to visible. If I ask you guys, how do you feel from thermal uh, sensation point of view, it's hard to even describe. But we make it visible. And actually, we are doing something that has not been feasible earlier. There are a number of companies who have put quite a bit of money and effort to solve and tackle this problem, but we are able, for the very first time, monitor this thermal uh, satisfaction of a person uh, real time and in non-invasive manner. And by the way, this non-invasive manner makes that no scratches are made to skin, no penetration to human body. It's like monitoring your heart rate by your uh, smartwatch. The purpose for this whole effort is that we save lives for the uh, workers working in hostile conditions. We also bring peace of mind to both workers and their superiors. And we bring new tools to manage the risk in these hostile conditions. Actually, we have already developed a working product being up and run on mobile phone, and we have validated this methodology by comparing the results which we have obtained by this software-based application to real actual measurements. There are some military, military tests, some emergency services, Academy Finland tests with uh, fire students, and probably one worth mentioning is also in, in Doha in year 2019. A 50k walker in World Championship, they ingested Pill, a telemetric pill, which was measuring the core temperature of these athletes during this awful four and a half hour walking competition. And when we compare our results to those results, we are more than pleased. It's good enough. Our product makes this thermal uh, sensation and hazards visual, as I told you earlier. We can monitor the thermal status of these firefighters, for example. This data can be delivered wirelessly to supervisor, and also it can be uh, stored for, uh, for log and reports. And above all, because it's online, real time, it can give you warnings, alerts, and estimate the safe operating time left. There are other business segments, naturally, mining, construction, and much more. For example, those citizens which died in, during these heat waves. We have estimated that the market size, the future market size of this application is huge. In occupational health, in consumer business, in healthcare, it's multi-billion. Uh, and our share, we have estimated it's hundreds of millions of euros a year. So we are visualizing and bringing the peace of mind for the workers. And here is uh, our plan for the future. We have this application up and running, and we intend to uh, raise funding, seed funding, in order to take those necessary next steps. And naturally, we would use this investment by doing collaboration with different disciplines, doing, measuring and learning what we have uh, achieved in this uh, pilot phase. We have listed a number of partners because we simply can't do this by ourselves. Technical partners, distribution partners and ecosystem partners. Here is our team. This uh, whole package has been, the core of this package has been developed at VTT. And we have also partners which have been developing this very first app. And at the moment, we are looking for 800,000 investment as a seed fund. And we would like to find such investors who could share our vision of this technology, bring not only money, but also the connections and networks, and being willing to commit to this application for the longer period of time.
Earlier today, actually, one famous person on this very stage mentioned something about this. We are not doing something ordinary and ask why. We really dream of things that never were, and we ask, why not? So thank you very much. Uh, I'll do my best to answer the questions, and later on, please contact Harry and me. There's a booth over there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pekka. Good pitch. So, so once again, you have a few customer segments. I can understand they're all pretty similar, so, so you, you could very well tackle all of them. But, but who uh, of them is, is like most eagerly awaiting for your product to get out there on the market? Simple answer. Firefighters. Because actually, they are fighting for their life. At the moment, there simply are no any services available for those guys doing this very, very valuable job. Same thing in construction business. We all know that 6,500 construction workers have died in Doha when building those football competition facilities. So the most meaningful business areas at the starting point would be these extreme uh, condition workers. But uh, my guess is that the biggest impact this whole technology will make in healthcare segment, in hospitals. It's hard to reach, so that's why we need to pay attention for, the, for this uh, lowest hanging fruits and convince ourselves, our partners, and then move on to consumer business in eventually in five years' time, for example, to this healthcare business. What sort of level is the technology? I mean, how fast could you get like a complete system to a couple of Finnish firefighter units and, and, and really gain sort of usage information and, and feedback? And uh, because I, I think that building on the story, it would be so great to, to hear also from actual usage in, in the field. So maybe you already have, but if you don't, how much more effort, money, time would you need to get this into a couple of firefighter units? There. I start where we are at the moment. We have an app. Being able to calculate a single person's thermal uh, status. And I would estimate that something between one and one half years, we are able to launch this kind of program uh, and, and service to firefighters and actually in this Emergency Academy Finland in Kuopio, they have already asked us, why on earth couldn't you generate something valuable for us? Because actually, they are at the moment measuring the core temperature of these firefighter students by an ingestible pill. And by the way, the cost level is 70 euros a piece, and it's disposable. Hey, I, I was still um, wondering, uh, what is the actual product? I mean, uh, do you have a separate, uh, you know, your own hardware or, you know, how do you do the invasive measuring? Are you using the existing functionality of your smartphone, you know, and just, so the innovation is on the app layer, yeah. you know, application layer and how you do the analytics or somehow kind yeah. of yeah. bring their information in a, in a, you know, you know, reasonable fashion to the user. Yeah, first and first part. Our focus is on software. We are world's best in solving the thermal status of a human being. So we focus on software. Hardware, never. We bring all the stuff from hardware point of view from the current market. And when, when doing this job, we really want to use as one kind of uh, role model for ourselves is first bit. First bit is not measuring any, any or not producing any gadgets. And the second part, what we need as an input data in order to carry out these studies is, first of all, your individual body composition. That's personalized analysis. That needs to be given once. That's static parameters, which we call. And later on, we need to have your heart rate, temperature of the environment, and level of clothing insulation. So based on these three sets of parameters, we can estimate your core temperature, your sweating rate, physiological strain index ranging from zero to 
to 10, and many, many other things. So the core input data is your heart rate, because it tells you your activity level, the amount of oxygen you are consuming, and finally, the amount of heat what your muscles are generating. So onboarding for this for a firefighter, they would download your app, they would connect their Apple Watch or something to give the heart rate. Uh, and then they would input a fair amount of personal information mm -hmm. and then start. Yeah, okay. that's it. Unfortunately, I've <laughs> one of the things I've done that's not gone very well uh, was a personal uh, thing that measured heartbeat and a bunch of other stuff. And we found it was very difficult to get people, before they understood how good it was, get them to actually input, you know, hmm. how tall they were and how much they weighed and how much they exercised. You know? Yeah. Um, is that, that's a barrier. You need to, how are you going to get past that? We are planning to collaborate with the end users. We are not telling what are their ultimate needs. We just bring something new on the table. It's a new paradigm. We offer something new. So we really want to collaborate with uh, clothing manufacturers, can those sensors be integrated to a t-shirt, for example? And other stuff like that. But it's a challenge. We need time and seed money, seed money to do that. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Pekka. Two more teams to go. Moving from the comfort of heat to accelerating computing. So the following two teams are offering solutions of bringing tremendously faster computing onto the market. Coming up first is flow computing that brings truly parallel computing, accelerating CPU uh, by hundredfold. Welcome on stage. All right, thank you, Lotta. Hey, good to see you all here. So Timo Valdonen from Flow Computing. Let's talk about us. Now the slides are there. Good. So overall, what we, what we were basically seeing in the world, so there's talks about Moore's Law being dead. So let me go into more detail what that could be about. So some ex, uh, ex, uh, examples on that one. The current CPUs really do have problems with their processing capability, and that's because of coherency issues and synchronization issues are not optimal. The traditional way to handle with this has been adding cores, adding hardware. You're not really diving in deep into the problem where the performance lag is will coming from. Yet again, so there, there would be places where you really need high performance. So there's sort of emerging applications, automated vehicles, real time. 3D, AI, and others that are really requiring a lot of more processing capability that they currently is available. And then quantum computing, even though there's sort of an, a lot of hype, a lot of activity around the quantum computing, it's not there yet. So it will take some years, it could take some decades. Practical limitations are still, practical applications are still limited. So it's not going to save us short or medium term. Let's dive deeper into the autonomous vehicles and how does the computer challenge present itself in the autonomous vehicles. Level 4 to level 5 autonomous vehicles. Level 4 means mind off, level 5 means totally uh, automated driving. So each of car will have something like 60 or 60 plus sensors that will be re required in a car to drive in a self-driving way. What it does, it generates 4,000 gigabytes of data, each and every day that's going to drive. When it gets more interesting, is more like the, what kind of a processing power you actually need to run this system and run this. So each car basically requires computer power that would be one petaflop. So one petaflop is quadrillion, quadrillion operations per second. Quadrillion is a number that has 15 zeros in it. 
just to take that into perspective, so the latest and greatest in processors by Apple, that's an iPhone 14, so they can do something like 0 0.002 petaflops. So you would basically need the oomph of 500 Apple's, Apple iPhones to be able to support the self-driving car requirements. Well, then taking a look at the supercomputer, the Fukaku in Kobe University in Japan, so used to be the, the fastest and most powerful supercomputer a couple of years back, so that does something like plus 400 petaflops, so that doesn't really do, so this is not going to work, so. So what we've done, so we've created the most, world's most advanced CPU accelerator, so we can accelerate the CPU performance by 100 times faster. How do we do that? So how does it really work? So we have five essential patent families that are based on several years of research on the topic. And really the secret, secret is this tick control flow technology that we have patented. So what it does, it basically combines the computations flowing through the same control path into, into uh, multiple synchronous data paths under a single control. That probably sounds like a cheaper is to you, but let me explain it in a more a uh, concrete example. So basically on, on here, so you have multiple synchronous, keating is synchronous data flows that are going under single control. It means that it's lightning fast. That's how our technology operates. On the other side, you basically have asynchronous data paths and they are all going through the same, again, underlying the word same, same control path. What does it mean so you get stuck? So this is caused by synchronization, coherency issues, so it doesn't really flow that well. So what, how does it really work in practice? How do you sort of implement this? So uh, take a CPU from company X, so Intel and so on. So basically it will act as a front end of this constellation and it will take care of the optim optimized low latency serial processors processing uh, of, the, of the computation. What do we do? So then we uh, combine our CPU accelerator as a backend, which will be handling the parallel processing of the constellation, and it will be optimized for extremely high throughput. So it really brings the oomph on the table. And how do we handle this true synchronous memory? So we have patented special technologies that we can really implement the synchronous memory. That is the big bottleneck on the current technology. And again, so additional bonus, so we get five times less code in our code base when you're utilizing our, our accelerator because we can eliminate the loop, you can eliminate the blocking, you can eliminate the sort of need to get rid of these synchronizations that are killing the performance. So that will be done as well. So we believe basically that we are a shortcut to next generation computing power. So flow computing will be based on kind of simple migration path, so it's easy to configure to, to work with your current CPU. When you do that, so it will be totally compatible, so it will work backwards compatible with all the existing soft software, all the existing applications that are out there. Everything is guaranteed to work. You can also uh, construct or compile it to a sort of a cost-efficient way, so perhaps using a little bit less core, so it means that you will have less size, less energy consumption, less cost. And again, so productivity increases there, so you can do much easier programming because you, you don't need to have so many code lines in your, in your codes. So where do you really need this? So what, what, who would benefit from 100 times faster computing? Autonomous vehicles we already talked about. So let's talk about metaverse, so real-time 3D. This is what we heard from our, our friends in Wario. So okay, what, it, what it does, so it basically would make the future metaverse not only look like real world, but behave like real world and feel like the real world. Another solution basically where you use this is would be in artificial intelligence and machine learning. So this would make machine learning in the core, uh, in the edge fast enough for serious IoT solutions, for example, in transportation, energy manufacturing and so on. So there will be tons of use cases for it. Of course, you could use it in telecom, defense, cloud computing, and who wouldn't be happy to have much faster, faster personal computers, personal devices, and faster photoshopping, so that would be working as well. 
What is our vision? So basically, what do we want to be the arm of high performance product processing? How do we get there? So what, is, what is the next step? So we want to do the proof of concept where the real target is that we will convince a tier one processor company, that means Intel, Qualcomm, Nvidia, or AMD, to be starting using our technology. This phase will be based on our seed round, and we will get the first licensable product concepts out there, uh, architecture license and HDL software. The next step would be the actual CPU accelerator that will be working together with these partners, existing CPUs, and this is the time when the significant licensing revenue will start to come in. And probably a strategic investor like Intel Capital will join in as an investor as well. And where we ultimately want to be is that there would be a next generation GPU that will be based on our technology and on our architecture. This would be really cash flow positive, positive and potential IPO time of, of our company. What are we asking? So what we basically would like to have in the seed round is 2.5 to 3 million seed, which will, which will be used for hiring the key persons in software development, in API development, hardware design flows and so on. And we are targeting it to do the round during the first quarter of next year. So, and again, so to final, finalize, here's our amazing team. So I've been planning our moon, moonshot for a while. And then Marty Forsell here in the middle has been the key innovator, CTO, chief architect for this flow computing technology, studying and patenting this for several years. And Jussi Roivainen has been designing it for several years as well, together with Marty. And we have now Enjoyed by a couple of advisors, so Jussi Mackinnon from Vario has been advising us to get the branding, marketing a bit right, and in order to tackle what ARM has been doing, so we are now in serious discussion with an ex-really really, uh, senior person from ARM who could help us with the licensing business model, open up the gates to, to the right places, to the right companies, and help us to get the productization right. So thank you for this. And, open for questions, so go ahead. Just questions. Yeah, Martin can help, so if there will be <laughs> deep technical questions, so. No, no, sorry, this yeah. is, I don't quite understand. Huh? You said that you could do a lot, the same thing with much yeah, less software, like many fewer code lines. Mm -hmm. But that means you'd have to rewrite all the software. That's a big barrier. But then you said it's backwards to battle. What's, what's actually the truth? Can you put this in now and use the existing software, or do you have to rewrite everything to take advantage of 100 times? The existing software and application will work. So what do you do? You modify some instruction set, uh, instruction level set code, so it will fit together. So you basically do some modification in order to get us to work together with the with the existing CPU, but all application, all software that has been written, for example, to Intel processor would not need to be redone. It's, it would already work. But of course, we need to do some software work to get us fit together. So, um, so if you think about the application of uh, you know the new generation smart cars, um, what have you done or? What do you know differently that allows you to truly kind of a, have a unfair competitive advantage towards, or if you compare yourself to other companies providing, you know, edge computing alternatives, you know, low, you know, getting the right latency and still, you know, the right battery consumption, let's say in the automotive mm -hmm. application area, what's different with your approach and how have you been able to prove that already? I think what we have done differently, so the parallel processing has been there and parallel programming has been there for decades. Nobody has so far cracked this uh, tough, tough uh, question about how do you do synchronization, how do you do coherency. But we have sort of done, done that so in, in, a, in, in, in a way that can be actually implemented and you get rid of these problems that it previously has been providing. So there hasn't been the uh, performance improvement so far hasn't been available. It's had been, had been sort of difficult to get, get in touch, but Marty can sort of elaborate a bit more. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, all existing commercial processors have the same problem that, that we are speaking about here. 
that uh, there are a lot of uh, cases, parallel patterns that they don't execute efficiently. And actually, programmers are so used to it and then they just uh, uh, take it as a given so that we can, we can uh, say, say with 100 processors, uh, we can achieve speed up of 10 and we are happy about it. So, so this is this is the case nowadays, and we can we can provide full speed up and then hundred x speed up. And do you know what the you know energy consumption would be in in that kind of case? I mean, energy consumption consumption is basically a parameter that you can play with. So if you take you, if you take all the performance improvement that you can get from us so that okay, you, you can use it for performance totally. But of course, what you can do so you don't have to take the full performance out of us. So you could basically start reducing the number of cores. You can start reducing sort of the number of number of sort of uh, cooling devices that you would have there. So you basically don't have to use it, use it as uh, energy consuming way as you do currently. You can op optimize it in, in a different way. Yeah, there can be trade-offs between uh, performance and, and, and energy consumption. Uh, and it means that uh, if you don't need 100x faster, you can make 100, uh, you can uh, have, have energy savings instead of that. You keep the same performance. No, I, I think this really sounds fascinating, and, and I mean, continuing on Moore's law at these times would be so great. But how? What do you still need in order to have like a set demo that that you have like this system up and running, and you can show that that you are able to deliver with this technology what you are, what you have visioned. We are already working on it, so we basically have a working demonstrator in, in place. So we have a HDL solution implemented on our backend. Now we are working on FPGA proof of concept. So we are getting a, quite a lot of sort of an old simulation and hardware in place and software that is convincing. But I think the next step, so what we what we're trying to do with the proof of concept is that it would be starting to run a bit more commercial instruction sets like uh, ARM instruction set or, or RISC-5 or X86. Yeah, and then also do commercial configuration. So our uh, current uh, proof of concept is scaled down version. It, it is not uh, having the uh, full, full resources of, of a big design. So, a hundred times faster up to, but rewrite all your software or take a big hits, okay? A lot of us use a lot of software that already exists. It's a kind of a big hit not to be able to use that. You'd have to have an entirely novel application, no more Linux, uh, sort of. or you have, what, what if you're just running regular software that all of us know about, what kind of speed it can you do with that? the current software base. It's a bit difficult to hear your question, but uh, what we do, so it's a hundred times faster. You don't need to rewrite the software. All the compatibility will be there. So it's backwards compatible with the existing application or software. What you need to do in order to implement it, for example, against Intel, so you need to modify the Intel APIs to work with, with us. So you need some software work. You don't need to work with all the application and software, but basically you need to fit because we would be the back end, so and the Intel, Intel processor would be in the front end. You need to do some software to work, uh, work to fit them together. So Okay, that sounds like the exact thing you need to get done so that people like me don't get worried. Uh, how long does it take to get your Intel API working? That seems to be the next necessary. Yeah, that depends when they will open up. So that's a question and discussion we are having. Uh -huh. So they, they would need to open up the, the APIs to us and work together. So that's exactly the convincing part that we are doing. And these, uh, these companies we are talking, they are hard, balls, uh, hard sort of an hard companies to find the right person. So we have booked now meetings with the sort of, a, not Intel, but one of the competitors to meet uh, uh, sort of an 
chief architects of the, of the CPU, CPU design, when you start to speak about the right terms, we haven't really found that person, so those persons in Intel, because we need to sort of get into that level. So the difficulty, that's exactly as you could say, um, go to market is easy and really, really difficult. The easy part is that we exactly know who we want to target. So we target Intel, AMD, Qualcomm and Nvidia, and Apple actually, because they are doing the system on chips as well. So we target five companies. The difficult part is that they are really damn big and complicated hardware companies. How do we find the chief architects? How do we find the people who are actually making the decision what kind of architectures they, they are doing and will be willing to open up the APIs to us? And that's also why we are talking now and getting this arm help on, the, on board. So because that will help us to identify the right persons to talk to. So Usually the way to do that is instead of pushing from you into Intel, is to find the power manufacturer or the end user says that you absolutely want that. And they are a big enough customer of Intel that Intel will then feel more forced to open up to you. You can't do it by yourself. You've got to go to the customer beyond yeah. Intel. That basically is a bit like sort of a theater of every part or warrior part. So you'd have this, that, okay, we would need to have it in our classes. We would need to have it in order to do the IoT. IoT. So that's a kind of a working as well. If you haven't looked into it, I mean, as an example, Intel, they have Intel Ignite, their accelerator startup program. So, I mean, ARM and others, I assume they have similar. So it's, it should be quite easy to reach out to them. Yeah. We have been talking with them when we have an open invitation basically to join into Intel Accelerator program anytime we want. So they, they, are, hungry to, they are hungry to get us in. So sort of, and that, that's something we don't know exactly what, if we want to do that we don't get too attached to the, to the ecosystem because it might be against some of the other players, but we'll see. Well, good luck. I mean, we need we need this on on the market, so we all keep our fingers crossed. All right. Hey, thank, thanks for your support. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, team. That was an active discussion. We have the last pitch to come from the team that has just joined the incubator uh, and uh, is coming up for the first time in this event. Um, processors chips for quantum computers, the stage is yours. Thank you, Lotta. Thank you, Lotta. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Very happy to be here. Uh, as you can see, I'm going to talk about Processors or chips, as you know, but a different kind. And uh, as Lotta said, we are the newest kid in the block on, on quantum tech. And it's really exciting. Uh, before I go into my pitch about what we do, let me tell you a story. Sorry about the grainy image, but uh, the story is very personal. So why do I care about quantum tech? Why do I care about quantum computing? Oh, no. So this is a path of a hurricane or that hit the eastern part of India a few years ago. And you can imagine the panic when you see this kind of a plot with a cone which shows that it's going to hit somewhere in 72 hours. And in that cone, there are 350 million people living there. So the cone is not good enough. This cone needs to get better. And this is my personal expectation from quantum computing. No computers now, even the supercomputers, can compute it in such a way that you can predict where the hurricane is going to hit. I hope someday quantum computing is going to do that. And this is my expectation, personal expectation. So this is, this is how I see quantum computing. But then going forward, I would share another grainy image. If you, if you understand this image, if I can explain this to image, this is half of my pitch. You see the two logos, right? And you understand from the previous uh, pitch what it, uh, the processors are, and Intel is a processor maker. But then you see the brand, then you see Apple, you see Mr. Jobs taking it from Mr. Otellini, the chip. And why is it important? I think we all understand now with the chip crisis why it is important, because it is a very, very important part of the value chain. If you don't have processors, you don't have good iPhones, you have nothing. 
So you need the processors, and that's what the heart of all computing devices are. And this is, this is the pitch. So this is what we are trying to do. But we are trying to do it from the quantum perspective. And from that point of view, if we look at the present, this is how it looks like now. So IBM's quantum computer has 433 qubits. I'm not going into the technical details of what qubits are, but let please accept my point that qubits are the ones that make quantum computing possible. And 433 is what it is. It's very good. Trust me, it's very good. But the cone that I showed before, it just gets a bit narrower. It doesn't get into a line. It doesn't tell me where it's going to hit. So we need a bit more. And it's the experts who say I, uh, that it, it needs to be more. It's not me who personally says. So we are looking at a quantum computing from an era where we are talking about tens and hundreds of qubits and looking into the million qubit era. And we have a long, long way to go. And this is the journey that we need to take. It's a marathon, but we need to take it now if we want to get there at some point. And this is how we see it uh, from our perspective. So 2016, when the whole thing started, there were five qubits. In 2025, we will have a thousand qubits. But then we are going into the million qubits. Is it a linear progress? No, it's not. It's very, very hard. And, and this is where all the challenges lie. Where do we get the scalability from? How do we make sure that the thousand qubits become a million qubits? If you take the thousand qubit machines now and you say it's going to be million, you have to take it with a pinch of salt. There are a lot of challenges there. And just to make sure what you understand, we are not talking about this quantum science. We are talking about the engineering. It's a hardcore engineering problem. Who gets there first wins the race. And, and that's why timing is extremely crucial for this purpose. So whoever has the capacity and, and potential to do the engineering will get there faster and will be the winner. And this is what we are hoping for with our team. And then let's step, step back with the semiconductors again. And, and if you know the story of quant, uh, computers, classical computers, if you have been to the quantum, uh, computer history museum ever, you will know how that came. And it's, it's the scalability of, of semiconductors which make these processors work. That it can scale from where it was 20 years ago or even 40 years ago and where it is now. So this, this is what makes things work. And this is the uniqueness of semiconductors which make it possible. Our question is, why aren't we using that to make quantum chips as well? Why are we trying to find a different solution? Why don't we fall back to the semiconductor which you know it works? We know it has a scalability. We can make it work. And this is, this is our core sort of question that we ask as a team. And this is what we do. And, and when I say what we do, I'm not really exaggerating, and I will show you in a minute why I'm not, that we are going for the best semiconductor quantum chips in the world. And I choose the word carefully here saying we are the best semiconductor quantum chips because that's our first step. Eventually, we would like to become the best quantum chips in the world but one step at a time, right? So this is our first uh, ambition. And the reason I can make this uh, claim is because of the team. And here you can see some of the achievements that we have in the team. We are not taking things just out of thin air. We have proved it. This is 20 years of hardcore research which has gone into this. And now we are confident enough to say we can get there. And then looking at competition, Obviously, there is competition. We are not the only one in the world thinking about this. And you can see some obvious names there. And, and the reason uh, I put it there is to tell you what the difference is between us and Intel. So if I tell you a bit in a rudimentary way, Intel is having a fantastic uh, sort of program going. What they are trying to do is take their fantastic processor that they have, that you have in your phones, and put it in a cryogenic or a low temperature process and make it work as a quantum. We don't do that. We don't take that processor and put it there. We start from materials and devices which we know works at low temperature and we scale it up from there. So the approach is a bit different, but we know there is a scalability, so we can make it work. So that is why we are still competitive to Intel's idea. And then there are other competitors coming from different parts of the world and we, we are keeping uh, eye on that and we know what they are going for. So we are aware of the competition. So not, this is the question. This is the question we ask ourselves. This is the question I pose to, uh, or put it in front of you, that whoever wins this scalability race will be the eventual winner. 
with that, I come to an end. I put some numbers here just for you to know that where we are going for and what we are going for. 20% of that business is already quite lucrative. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, and, and congratulations on the world records. That's that's excellent. Uh, how stable uh, are, are, is your technology at the moment? So when you said it's an engineering task, do, do you have like a working qubit at the moment that is stable enough for long computations or? Correct. That's a fantastic question. Yes. So we have tested the coherence times and, and whatever the parameters that key performance indexes are. And we, we believe that they are there to be there, uh, to be scaled up, let's say. Uh, we are not uh, trying to optimize the signs. So we are not trying to make the qubits as perfect as possible. We are trying to make them a workhorse so that they work as good as possible towards the scalability. So yes, we, 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 we have that. Uh, really impressive and kind of a bold, bold vision that I think most of us are kind of uh, fascinated if, if you could pull it off and really encourage that. Um, what is your background and uh, can you shed some light on the, on the teams? And, and if I may also add a second question, uh, I assume you're raising funding. I mean, how will you use that and what are, what are the kind of the milestone that your team yourself have set up to achieve with that funding? So twofold question, the team yourself and, and the funding. Fantastic question. I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself in the beginning, just to keep in time. So I, myself, am the program manager for quantum technologies at VTT. So I lead the quantum programs in VTT. As a background, I have a PhD in applied physics, uh, and that was a long time ago, but I have been involved in innovation management since uh, early 2000s. So that's, that's my background. And the team, I'm, I'm the small player there. The team is, uh, I, I cannot disclose them because we haven't come out in public, but they are uh, very well recognized global experts in this field. So let's put it this way. So if you if you Google VTT quantum uh, semiconducting quantum cube uh, technology, you will find them. And so they are there. And and the next question is about the funding, right? So yeah, we we are uh, very cost conscious about time. We want to go now because the competition is heating up. We, we think that it's extremely important that we start as soon as possible. So we are trying to close a, a round as soon as we can. And we want to get the lift off so that we can have a runway for two years so that we can prove what we are trying to do. And beyond that, we will see. We, we, we want to prove it first and then we go big. So just to kind of clarify, I mean, um, how much are you you're looking to raise and what are the kind of the, the internal milestones that you could, you know, look yourself in the mirror or the team look yourself in the mirror and say, hey, now now we we convinced or we reached these, uh, these, let's say, milestones or kind of targets. Yes. Excellent point. I should have clarified that. Uh, from a milestone perspective, we are looking at patents. That's the first couple of years. We are going to go all in on patents. The second point is uh, developing the process so that we can show the scale. So we would start with two qubits, but we intend to go to 10 qubits in, in two years. And again, I wouldn't ask, I, I should ask you not to put too much attention to the numbers. It's the scalability promise that comes with it that, that is key. And for the first couple of years, we believe we can uh, have a good start if we reach a or if we have two million in, in the in the pocket to to be relaxed to go there, but we are not only focusing on VC funding. We are looking for public funding as well, just to make sure that we have sufficient critical mass when we go forward. How do you see the funding landscape within quantum? Now that there's a huge excitement and 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 on overall not just about you sort of what what do you think will be the next breakthroughs in quantum that will keep up this sort of excitement about this new technology excellent excellent question well first of all europe has vetted on this quantum flagship uh, from a public funding perspective and that is a one billion promise for 10 years and that has program has been running and it's a fantastic uh, opportunity for startups to come and, and create uh, op uh, companies there. Uh, going forward, I think we need to have 
what I mentioned, scalability. Because quantum computing, we have demonstrated, companies have demonstrated it works. Now it's about what's next, how far can you go? Because with the quantum computers that we have right now, you can use it in a way so that you can accelerate some of the classical computing. So we call it that quantum accelerator. But to do real quantum computing, you need to get to a point where you can have a full-scale quantum computer. So that would be the question coming up. That where are you? But, but that full-scale quantum computer will probably not be any, anywhere near in no. the near future. So will there be like some commercial wins that you, you believe could, could sort of uh, keep up the enthusiasm? Absolutely, absolutely. First of all, we have to show the scalability. That's the first thing. And within that, what we will do, and every other quantum computing company will do, is go into this uh, quantum accelerator model. So work with supercomputers and other computer structures to build the accelerator so that you can reduce the computation time to a certain extent using quantum uh, processes. And then the other uh, thing for us is, as you have probably realized, we are not a full stack quantum computing company. We are focusing on processes because we think that is hard enough. So we will be partnering with uh, system integrators and, and that is where the interesting bits will happen because system integrators are also getting their uh, devices and systems better. So it's a parallel process. So we bet improve, they improve, and the whole thing then goes forward in a, in a, in a very scalable way. So th this is critical that the partnerships are built and, and uh, the market are then addressing or getting addressed by those partnerships from the processes. Side. Excellent. Thank you. I, I don't know if we have any more questions, but we are really hoping to see this on the market. Thank you very much. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So that was the last pitch. Fantastic. Thank you very much for all the questions.